Mm -hmm. And um, Bolo Zenden went in to speak to Rafa as a senior player and said, listen, the players are tired, not only physically, but mentally. They need a day off. Um, Bolo didn't get in the squad for the next probably month. Monk, it's a very, very, very special episode because uh, we're joined by none other than Stephen Bonner. 540 senior appearances, 67 of them were for Liverpool, two England caps as well for the three Lions. It's a pleasure, Stephen, to have you on our very modest and our very little channel. It just means the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. You're both looking very <laughs> smart. <laughs> so I feel left, feel left out, no shirt, no glasses. You guys are showing me up. <laughs> oh, no, thanks for having me, guys. I, uh, I appreciate you uh, asking me to come on. So uh, before, before we get into serious business, there's something that your very good friend, James Milner, said two odd years back. And I want your opinion on that. He said that pineapple belongs on a pizza. Does it, Steve? <laughs> no. Absolutely not. <laughs> Who puts pineapple on a pizza? No. Yeah? No. Yeah? Nidhi, Why? what about you? No, no, absolutely not. There's no place uh, for pineapple on a pizza. Put it on a fruit custard. Pizza is for different things. Correct. Correct. Man, if you're on a warning, you'll be getting kicked out of this. Yeah. I'm yeah, cut off on of the video already. This guy, this, guy is not, this guy is not invited for any meals from now on. But speaking of pizza, uh, but speaking of pizza and pineapples, uh, Stephen, I mean, uh, I know that you know you've had your share of pizzas during your holidays. But after holidays comes the preseason, and you've been part of preseasons for some very prestigious clubs. So, I mean, and let's talk about the preseason that's that our players are going, uh, you know, having right now. What they must be feeling. I mean, is it different from club to club preseason, or is it essentially the same? Yeah, no, it, it can change from club to club. Uh, some clubs will be, basically, it'll be a running club for the first couple of weeks and you won't see football. Some of the clubs will be football only all the way through it. But I think the big difference with Jurgen Klopp and the way that he plays is, is that you know it's going to be high intensity. It's going to be difficult. Um, I'm fortunate enough to still work for LFC TV, so I get to listen to quite a lot of the interviews and listen to what's going on in around the training camp. And I think what you, you understand is, is that while the teams are playing uh, in, the, in the afternoon or the evening, they've pretty yeah. much done a full session in the morning as well. So it's relentless. It's two, three sessions a day. But you, you come to terms with it very quickly that that is what pre-season's pre for. And you know you're going to be tired. You're going to be aching all over. Um, you're maybe going to be sick at times because of the amount of running that you're doing. Um, but that is pre-season. You've, you've had like such a long career, such such a massive career. How different were the pre-seasons? For example, Rafa gave you that break at Liverpool. You had a number of games under Rafa, but then you moved over to Blackburn. And I know you highly rate Sam Allardyce as a man-manager. So how different were the pre-seasons? Well, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of the pre-seasons are very similar because it gets taken out of the hands of the manager because it gets put into the, the fitness coaches, the sports scientists. And then it depends as well how many games that you've got. This season and last season will have been massively challenging for, for the managers. How to arrange games um, with the COVID restrictions, whereabouts that they are going to um, be based because obviously Liverpool have been based in Austria for three weeks. Then they've gone to Evian in France for a week. Yeah. So it's been a month away, which will have been really challenging for, for not only the, the players and the families, but the coaches to try and keep the players happy, to keep them interested in, in training every day, not to have them getting on top of each other. But um, most, most clubs are, are similar in the way they approach it. They trust the the staff, the, the sports scientists to, to manage the 
the workload, if you like, and, and how hard they push the players. But now with the GPS systems mm-hmm. that are in place, a lot of the time, the the players will be told how much they can do in a day. They'll yeah. be told when they need to be rested and it'll be the same during the season as well. So um, I think there's been big changes probably, I'd say, in the last five or six years mm-hmm. where the sports scientists basically run the pre-season and, and they have the final say on what goes on on that day. Well, absolutely. And, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, speaking of pre-seasons and seasons, uh, Stephen, you've uh, played most of your, your football um, at Liverpool and under uh, Rafa Benitez, who's now crossed the Stanley Park, Park divide and gone yeah. on to the blue side. So what's your take on that? I mean, how do you see that panning out? I found it very strange uh, at first, but then when you sit back and look at it, uh, his family still live in the area, his wife, mm. his kids. Um, it's an opportunity to to come back into the Premier League. I think the right. work that he's done throughout the city uh, is incredible, but to go from the red red half to the blue half or vice versa is always a huge, huge thing. Um, now, it's different for players because they can run around on the pitch. If it's not quite going for them, they're not quite playing well, they can put in a tackle, they can show they're fully committed, whereas the book stops with Rafa. Yeah. Um, if they don't win the game, the, pl- the, the fans will go for Rafa. It'll be his, his, his neck's on the line effectively. Um, so he has to get results straight away. Um, it is a, it's a big, big thing. Um, one thing I will say about Rafa is, is that he's got very thick skin. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, Everton, the Everton fans turning up outside or close to his house with the, the banners, he will not even think about that. That won't even enter his head. The only thing that will enter his head is, I'll prove you wrong, I will make this work. Um, he is a very, very hard-working, dedicated manager. Um, there'll be no stone unturned behind the scenes to make sure that he'll. if he fails, he won't fail from a lack of trying and a lack of preparation and a lack of organisation. Uh, he'll make sure everyone in and around the training ground, whether it be staff members, caterers, kit men, players, they will all be, they'll all know what their job is to make sure that the football clubs are success. So um, it's an Everton. I've got one of the hardest working managers in football now. There's, there's no two ways about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Liverpool fans has been a little bit of a, a mixed reaction in the city. I think he's obviously still got the affiliation of the fans because of what he won. And, yeah. and obviously the, the famous night in Istanbul. However, if he's successful, that'll soon change. That's so true. Yeah, I mean, if, if, he, if he does win... Something. I think since 1995, they haven't won a trophy. They haven't won a trophy. They haven't yeah. won a trophy yeah. since 1990. If that changes, I'm sure a lot of people will have a lot to say. But Stephen, uh, we got a question from Amir, who said, how difficult was it to compete with John Anarisa and Triore straight away as you came up the academy and successful loan spells? Do you feel Rafa gave you a fair crack at it? Uh well, I'll answer the, the last part of that. No, I don't. Uh, I don't feel that I got a fair crack of the whip, if I'm being honest. I felt like there was games where I'd played very well um, and then didn't get the opportunity to play the next game because of rotation. Mm-hmm. But that was something that Rafa bought into the Premier League, really. There was him and probably uh, Claudio Ranieri when he came in at, at Chelsea, was was known as the tinker man for changing his, his yeah. team constantly. And that was something that was new to me because I'd just been on a previous loan spell and played pretty much every game in the season. And you knew if you played well, you were playing the next game. But going into Liverpool is a, a different uh, proposition. You're, you're playing with better players. You're also got, um, you've got better players in your position as well. So it's always going to be difficult to get into the team. But I, I felt that the only opportunity I get um, to, to prove myself was to actually leave Liverpool because I didn't want to play one in three games, one in four games. I wanted to, to play every game. And yeah. that's when I, I, felt, I felt that my career really took off was when I went to Blackburn and Aston Villa. But do you feel, Stephen, in, in such scenarios, someone like a Stephen Gerrard's voice was actually heard by Rafa? For example, if someone wanted you to play more games and was taking a stance for you, Rafa was so thick-skinned that he probably didn't entertain those thoughts. He was very rigid in his ways. 
he wouldn't he wouldn't think about that at, at all. Um, his philosophy was always about the team, what he thought was right for the team. Don't forget, Rafa Benitez was the person who set, who accepted a bid for Steven Gerrard. Yeah. So Rafa Benitez yeah. was very strong-minded in the fact of no player was bigger than the club. That's the way he felt. Um, he was willing to to sacrifice Gerrard to get a transfer kitty to buy more players. It wasn't until the fans revolted and that, that suddenly changed. So um, no, you, you'd never get senior players being able to talk. I, I remember one time uh, we had another, and this sounds like really uh, petty, but when you're playing every single day or training every single day, you're travelling so much. We hadn't had a day off for three months. Mm-hmm. And um, Bolo Zenden went in to speak to Rafa as a senior player and said, listen, the players are tired, not only physically, but mentally. They need a day off. Um, Bolo didn't get in the squad for the next probably month because he'd gone to question the manager's authority and, and his decision-making. Um, we got a day off <laughs> after it. But <laughs> it was almost uh, a don't challenge me. Uh, this is I'm, I'm the manager and, and that's that. Wow. Okay. Wow. wow. We've we've got we've got another question about our current uh, squad though, uh, Stephen. Uh, and this is by uh, a user called Jersey Zero Eight. Do you think that uh, Andy Robertson has been you know the uh, is perhaps one of the best left backs that we've ever had in our history? Yeah. Um, I think he, he, he's got to probably show it for a few more years. I think back to, uh, I, I mean, I didn't get to obviously witness him live, but you think of the likes of Alan Kennedy. Uh, Steve Nichol was an incredible fullback as well. Yeah, you've he, We've had incredible fullbacks. Rob Jones's career was cut short in, in when he was a right back. Um, but you think of players who've played in those positions. Um, Robbo's an incredible player unbelievable and, and I think more so in the fact of when you think of current markets and the, the, the money that players are going for to buy a player from Hull for £8 million pounds who've just been relegated and everyone looked at the signing and said no it's not a Liverpool signing how's this mm-hmm. going to work what's going on then he didn't play for that long period of time yeah. Moreno was playing and everyone just thought well he's a backup player and then he came in and just showed this incredible form and never ever, and for me, I can probably count on my hand, one hand, the amount of games that he's had where I've thought, not his best, but still played well. Yeah. He never really drops below a seven. Um, yeah. He's always a, a very steady player. And um, yeah, yeah, he's a phenomenal player. And obviously he's still got many, many years ahead for, for him, himself at Liverpool. And, and that's the great thing for Liverpool is that they've, they've got, Arguably, two of the best world fo- uh, fullbacks in world football. Yeah, Stephen, do you think uh, you would have worked marvelously, or you would have been the perfect left back for Jurgen Klopp yourself? Uh, I'd like to have thought so. Yeah, um, because of the way he plays and the intensity that you train at. I think many players now will look at Jurgen Klopp and will look at sports science. Will look at the 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 facilities in and around the training ground and everything that's bought with it, the nutritional side. Yeah. And players from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s will all probably think the same. I'd love to play now. I'd love to play on the perfect surface with everything behind the scenes. So well organised, so well drilled. They almost make you into the complete athlete and then it's up to your technical, tactical ability then to shine through. And I just think if you are playing for Jurgen Klopp now, you would just enjoy yourself. And that's one of the biggest things I look at. Yeah, it's hard work, but it is, football is hard work. It's not easy at, at all. But to play for someone like him and, and the way that they play, it's brilliant to watch and, and I'm sure it's even more enjoyable to play in. I have to interrupt over here because I'm just over the moon because we're doing this video with Stephen Bonock and my COVID report has come in and it's negative. So I'm very happy. So, so congratulations to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> but Stephen, you mentioned about hard work. Uh, someone that you probably have seen more of compared to us is uh, Javi Elliott, Blackburn. You made the move from Liverpool to Blackburn and... Uh, the most number of club games, if I'm not wrong for you, were at Blackburn. Am I correct in saying that? Mm, no. <laughs> no. No? 
<laughs> I, I I think I think you're there and thereabouts with Villa. I think yeah, very close. Villa. Yeah. All right. So, but you made the move from Liverpool yeah. to Blackburn. <laughs> so you've seen Harvey Elliott quite often. Now, can you just tell us what kind of player he is? Well, I think first and foremost, I'll just tell you a couple of things that I've heard about him. So when he first turned up at Liverpool from signing from Fulham, the the players were hugely impressed, not only by his confidence, but his ability for such a young player. Um, right. When he when he went to Liverpool, he was 16 years old, but naturally fitted in with the first team players and almost looked like he was so at ease at that level. And then going to Blackburn to make that loan move. It's important when you make a loan move, the type of club that you go to, the environment yeah. that you're going into, the players that you're going to be in and around. And speaking to the likes of Stuart Downing, obviously who's, who's played for, for Liverpool, I played with Stuart at, at Aston Villa, was what was he like? And he just said, a phenomenal talent, a phenomenal, phenomenal player. Like, sees passes that other players don't see, but also can execute them, can take people on. Yeah. I think when you look at the condition that he's come back in pre-season, he looks stronger. Looks like he knew he had to physically build, beef himself up a little bit and get stronger, like you like to do, Manus. I noticed that in the gym all the time. Um, yeah. Oh, you've shrunk. <laughs> uh, that, that's what she said as well but it's okay <laughs> um, but I think with with um, with Harvey Elliott he's what's been interesting this season is with, with Blackburn he played higher up but in yeah. the pre-season games for Liverpool this season Jurgen Klopp's played him in the midfield three because he trusts him and he yeah. trusts him tactically to understand the game and when you think how young he is, to have that trust in someone, to be able to do that, um, I think he's going to be a player who Jurgen Klopp will will use um, at times this season. He's not going to... I don't think he'll start games to, to begin mm -hmm. with, but depending on his form, it's the case of coming on for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then you've got to force the manager to think, I need to start him. He's showing things to me here that I've not seen him do. Um, or... He's maturing better, probably is the better way to put it. And yeah. he's understanding what we're trying to do. And we're getting something out of him. He's influencing football games. Absolutely. But but Stephen, do you think, you know, he should probably go out for, for on loan for a season again? Or do you think he's ready to play for Liverpool? No, I think when you look at his statistics last season in the championship, yeah, I'd, I'd probably say it's not too easy for him but he was com more than comfortable at that level. He needs the next challenge now. Now, if he was to go out on loan, you'd be thinking, Premier League team. But you look at the likes of Phil Foden and his progression staying at Manchester City and you think playing with better players in and around them, getting 20, 30 minutes for Liverpool, yeah. chasing at the top end of the league, for Champions League spaces, for the Premier League, that will be more important to him training every single day with the team. Um, and that'll be huge for his progress. And the big thing is as well, Liverpool haven't got the biggest of squads. If they're going to get rid of Shaqiri, they're going to get rid of Origi, which is what we're hearing and what's being talked about. Well, he will be needed then. Yeah. Um, because you will get suspensions, you will get injuries, and there'll become a, a time where it, 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 he is needed. But does, doesn't that frustrate you, Stephen, as an ex-player and someone who's working for the club in your capacity and is a supporter, does it frustrate you that someone like and Harvey Elliott, he's a great talent, like we all have heard about it, but we probably have to rely on him when he's so young. A team that has won the Champions League a few years back, a league a year back, is not able to go out and get the players. Instead, is relying on someone like Harvey Elliott. For all we know, Harvey Elliott could be the next big thing. Yeah. But Manus, Manus, don't be jealous. It's not a good trait. You're, <laughs> jealous of Man You're jealous of Manchester City and Chelsea and Man United spending all this money. I, 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 listen, Stephen, my point, of view is that, you know, my point of view is that we are competing for the same competition. Exactly. Yeah. And if, if someone like a City just buys greatest for 100 and came for 130, we are here relying on Minamino and Harvey Elliott who get to prove their worth at Liverpool. It's just a frustrating thing. It, yeah, listen, it, it's, it's frustrating to a certain point, but if you don't have the money, you simply cannot do it. 
you've got you're competing with you're not competing with one of the richest men in the world. He's like one of the I mean, this guy's on a different level, the Manchester City owner. Abramovich is on a different level. These guys will make back in interest overnight what they've spent on them two players. Liverpool simply don't have the funds to, to compete with that. And when you look at FSG, you look at how they've they've improved the stadium. They're now yeah. building the Anfield Road. They've built a new training ground, the infrastructure around it. But they've also lost a, a lot of money, not only with losing ticket sales at Liverpool, but at the, at the Boston Red Sox. This is a company that yeah. makes money through both company through um, through both sporting companies. But when there's been no money paid in, they don't make money. They can't make money off the back of it. Um, so it's very difficult for them to do what they've done. I saw a statistic as well about since Solskjaer's uh, been in charge at Manchester United, he spent over 380 million, 390 million. Yeah. Liverpool have spent 117. But Klopp still won the Champions League and the Premier League. It's not always about what you spend and how you spend and, and who you spend it on. If Jurgen Klopp was manager of Manchester United, they'd have won the league last year. I You've think, got to trust your manager. Your manager is 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 as important to anything. Uh, Jurgen Klopp is huge for Liverpool, and having the players back that you'll have back this year will change the dynamic in, in which Liverpool play. But the point of what you're making is is relying on younger players. I completely understand that. The transfer window is not shut yet. Yeah, they will. They will probably sign a couple of players. If Origi and Shakiri go, I I fully expect. One, well, one definitely to come in, and perhaps two, and I think that'll be a midfielder and a striker. Well, uh, and you know, speaking of FSG, Stephen, you as you rightly pointed out, I mean, that's the structure, and you know, perhaps you know, even Jurgen Klopp. Do you think he likes working with younger players? Is it something that that's even by design? I mean, um, and he's not really going out in the market and get someone. Uh, who may not get an immediate starting eleven and in turn disrupt the dressing room, something like that. Yeah, I think he'd, he'd like a mixture of both, wouldn't he? In an ideal world, he'd like to be able to promote the youth players because they are good enough and they are capable of playing in the first team. I think when you look at Trent Alexander-Arnold, if you'd have put him in in most other teams, yeah. would he have done what he's doing now? He's been allowed to make mistakes within the team. So Jurgen Klopp trusts him. Um, he backs his ability as a manager and a coach and his coaching staff to make him a better player. Now, I think, he, again, with the likes of Harvey Elliott, Curtis Jones, I think yeah. this season Curtis Jones could be incredible. I think he just needs a little bit more confidence to showcase what he could do. Um, but he is a phenomenal talent. Now, if you can get players like that into the heartbeat of the team, who are Liverpool fans, who've grown up in the area, definitely Trent and, and Curtis, um, but Harvey Elliott is a Liverpool fan and, yeah. and a strong Liverpool fan as well. Well, what better way to get them players into the team who understand what it is to be a fan of the club? So I think Jurgen Klopp is, he's, he's probably sat on the fence a little bit where he'd yeah. like a bit of both. He'd, lo he'd love that mixture. You can bring a world-class youngster in from the youth team. Perfect. If you can't, then we'll, we'll accommodate a little bit and we'll try and bring players in for... For, for the budget that they can afford them, which they've done extremely well over the last last few years. Just to clarify as well, Stephen, uh, we have a lot of debate in India per se about our owners. And yeah. uh, me and Nidhi are very, very level-headed and probably leaning towards pro-FSG. And we get a lot of stick for that yeah. at times. Yeah. But do, yeah. do you think there is a growing... Uh, feeling of discontent back home in Liverpool about the way probably, like, like we all know it's successful, it's working, we've won what we need to win. But is there a slight feeling of discontent? Yeah, I think the big thing is, is that uh, when they changed the ticket prices a few years ago, right. um, they, they upset the fans. Then the fallout not so long ago with the Super League, not consulting the fans again. Right. I think the change in what they've done going forward has been positive in the way that they are looking to put um, someone on the, well in board meetings to, to have a say and, and to speak to them, to get the fans' opinion on it, where they can go back and, and see how the fans feel about that. I think that's a positive step. 
when, when you look at what the, the owners have done, and, and I'm the same as you, I, I think every, every owner has his pro and his con. They, they exactly. always have their ups and downs, and there's always po- positives and negatives. When Liverpool were bought, they were in one of the worst situations in football, in, 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 in the English leagues, in, in world mm. football. They were an absolute mess. And they paid, I think it was about 350 million, yeah. maybe less. Well, now that now their business model is worth about two to four billion, right? That's incredible. That's how you build a business, and you're also building a successful one on the pitch. Now, I understand fans will say, "Well, if it's worth four billion, then why aren't we putting that into the team?" Well, yeah. they simply don't have that. That's on paper. If they were to sell the club, then they would make four billion pounds off the back of it. So the club is extremely well run behind the scenes but they will not put themselves in a situation where they go out and spend a hundred million. The mm. Van Dyke and the Allison situation was off the back of selling Coutinho. The yeah. money wasn't just suddenly created um, off a checkbook from FSG to go, here you go, go and buy the best centre-back in world football. That was facilitated by selling other players. And that's been the business model all along. The fans have to get used to that and understand that that's part and parcel of the, of the way that Liverpool is run. Um, the only way that'll change is if someone else comes into the club and changes the business model and opens up a checkbook. But will the club still have that feel to it? Um, the, the club's changed hugely since since I left it and it's yeah. been taken over twice in that period. And now when I go back to Liverpool, I feel welcomed. I feel that I'm part of the club. I never felt that before. So yeah. FSG and the people that they employ are doing the right things behind the scenes. Um, I used to struggle even to go into the ground. People didn't know who you were, what you were wow. doing, what, or trying to get tickets. It's so easy and accessible now to, to, to be in contact with people. To And they're, they're the little things that are, are, are yeah. nice touches in and around the place. So, um, listen, are they the perfect owners? No. Are they good owners? Yes. That's my opinion. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, Manas, that's that's what, you know, you and I have also always maintained. I mean, the, uh, of course, we, we would all like to have more players and, you know, 100 different things. But what they've done for the club uh, is incredible. I mean, I mean, I have grown up thinking if we could just win one Premier League and they got us that. And, you know, going into this season, can we win it again? Yes, we can. Yes, uh, we can. Exactly. I mean, I. That's why I don't understand the the absolute hate that you know they get sometimes. And talking yeah. about hate and talking about fan reaction, Stephen. Um, you obviously, you know, you played your football when social media was not that active, and you know the 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 new age social media fan was not as vicious as they are now. Um, yeah. I mean, Jeannie Van Allen obviously, uh, you know, spoke about it. Uh, we saw, we also saw what happened with Neko Williams, uh, you know, last season. Do you think that, you know, because of the ruthlessness of social media, it's that much more difficult for a footballer to make it uh, nowadays? Or, you know, is it something that you can just tune out of? And just to add to that, Stephen, sorry, like even now, Adrian, he's our player. Exactly. Any post that is put by Liverpool, Cool right now about Adrian, it just received received so much negativity. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just not so not true, not watch. true. Yeah, but they're not true fans. Exactly, they're not real fans. Um, they're not nice people. I, I'm not a fan of social media one bit. I can't stand it. Um, I I made a conscious decision probably a month ago not to interact on it, not to post anything, not to really be active on it. I flick through it every now and again for work purposes, just to see what's going on, transfers, speculation. Um, but I, I, I'd find it very difficult now. Um, I had incidences when I was playing where social media was just getting on the rise and I was reading it and I, was, I look back at it now and think, why would you read it? The people who are commenting don't know certain, they don't know what's going on behind the scenes. A lot of them don't know football. A yeah. lot of them don't know your club in general. Um, and you can get really offended by it. I think the players these days is, there's this sort of big perception where it's build a brand. 
Mm. Build, build your profile and things like that. Why? You play for Man United, Liverpool, Chelsea, Man City. You're already a, a superstar. Exactly. Now, it's all about making more money. These guys have got unlimited amounts of money that they're getting paid at the moment. It's phenomenal the wages that they get paid. But then I also understand the side where, well, the fan interaction, it's great for the fans to be able to interact with the players and get that closeness to them. It's, it's closer now than it's ever been. But what you're finding now is, is that fans are overstepping the mark. Yeah. And they feel like, well, I can say what I want to you now. Well, why can you? Because if I was to turn around and say a negative thing about you or go back at you, yeah. I could get reported for it, can get fined for it uh, by the FA, by the PFA, whoever it might be, by FIFA. So there's got to be a tolerance level. The, all, all, the other side of it as well, which I find um, interesting is, is the players want to be a, accountable for looking after their accounts because often they try and employ companies to look after them. Yeah. And when a company make a mistake, that company isn't accountable for it. It's your account. So you get the blo- you get the stick, you get the, the backlash of, of everything that's gone wrong if there's, a, there's been a mistake on a post. And there's been plenty of them. Yeah. And the players are made to look stupid. So what do the players do? They feel like, I've got to put a post on after a game or before a game or just to, to keep, keep up appearances. Yeah. It's such a, a such a hard thing to try and manage, and um, I'm happy I'm out of it. If I'm being completely honest. But on a scale of one to ten, Stephen, how much do you rate James Milner's social media? I think it's just brilliant. One hundred. One hundred. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It is good. But I think his is more his is more humorous, isn't it? Yeah. And people just enjoy it. There's no there's nothing to over the top about it. It's just simple little posts, but exactly. with humorous posts to it. And I think it's it's not only Liverpool fans that enjoy it, it's just football fans in general. Um, mm. And I think just fan, just sports fans or any type of fan, just enjoy your social media. It's good fun. I mean, we, we absolutely love James Milner. I mean, I, I can assure you, we, we are his biggest fans. Uh, but just to close things off, Stephen, I mean, uh, the season's going to start um, in less than 10 days. Um, yeah. What's your expectations and, you know, what do you think this season is going to look like for Liverpool? Well, I, I think they'll compete again. Um, I think last season was was a very, very difficult season with, with the injuries, with COVID, with lack of fans in the stadium. I think um, this weekend... Saturday and uh, sorry Sunday and Monday Liverpool play at Anfield in two two uh, two of the final games in pre-season the 75 percent allowed into the stadium and I think you'll you'll see the lift that it will give the players the atmosphere the buzz and then to obviously bring back the injured players um, to add Canate Can- uh, into the mix as well Liverpool will now be able to defend again higher up the pitch they'll be able to press higher up they'll be able to condense the spaces make it hard for teams to play against. Um, and I think I think this will be the most competitive season in the Premier League. I honestly do. I think it'll be Liverpool, Chelsea, Manchester City and Manchester United. And I just think the four are really going to go toe-to-toe. Um, I think it'll be in interesting. Order. Say again? In that order? I don't know which order I said it in. You said Liverpool first, so uh, that's what I'm saying. All yeah, I take that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. go with that. Um, but I do. I think it'll be. I think it'll be hugely competitive. I think Liverpool will. They have to start the season well. Um, yeah. Now, Norwich away is arguably the fixture you'd looked at and gone. Well, if we'd have played them at home, you'd have been delighted. But to play them away is still a good game to play. Mm-hmm. A newly promoted team, yes, they'll be a little bit dangerous because they'll they'll have that lack of fear element and they'll be excited to start the season. But get that three three points on the board and start to build momentum. And what you've got to just try and do is you've got to pray that Manchester City start slowly again. Yeah. And that their pre-season, I don't know if you've followed much of pre-seasons of, of other teams, but Manchester City, Manchester United have struggled to get really competitive football 
Whereas Liverpool's uh, pre-season has been very competitive. It's been tough. Um, so you're hoping that those levels will take you into the first four, four or five games of the season. And you're hoping that the likes of Manchester City, Manchester United might just get caught cold a little bit. I think mm. it'll be interesting to see how Manchester City fare in the Community Shield uh, at right. the weekend to see how up to speed they are and where they're at. But it, listen, it'll be, it's going to be brilliant, isn't it? The fans back in, um, supporting the teams. I think on a whole, just, I'm, I'm excited myself because I went to so many games last season where there was no fans and even myself getting out the car, walking across the car park into the stadium, not yeah. having that interaction with fans to see how they're feeling about the team, what's going well, what's not. Um, getting in the media room, the buzz of that. But then when the teams come out for the warm-up, that, eru- that, that roar that comes up, that buzz that you get. And this is what I've always wanted. Like, I, I, like I just want that, that buzz to come back into stadiums. And uh, I went to the, the Leeds game at the end of the season and Leeds played. Wow. I mean, the hairs on the back of your neck were stood up on the arms. I was just thinking, this is what it's, this is football again. So to get going at the start of the season, I am so excited. I can't wait because uh, it makes it makes my job more enjoyable as well because uh, you, you look forward to it so much more. So I can only imagine how the players and the managers are feeling to to get back out in front of the fans and, and to play. But even speaking to the fans, they cannot wait to get in there to scream for the team. So yeah. it's going to be great. We are like thousands and thousands of miles away and still, I mean... We just want to see yeah. fans back there on a television screen. We want to see that yeah. because it just adds so much. Stephen, it was a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much thank for you. doing this for us. And I just got a call a few days back from a club in Mumbai. They want this stone back. Maybe eventually that will happen someday when we visit, <laughs> when we visit uh, Mumbai once again. If, if it happens... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether you remember it, but but maybe, maybe it's a story for some other day. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, it was <laughs> thanks it, for having it, me on. And generally, so it's generally it means the world to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for having me on, guys. Very kind. Okay, guys. So this was Menace and the Monk. Uh, uh, I think this was our best episode because we got the man himself, Stephen Warner. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.